Hi, welcome to Project Geospatial. I'm Adam Simmons, and here with me is John Bean, CEO and co-founder of Mem Computing. John, can you uh, g- give us an introduction of who you are, what Mem Computing is, and the interesting projects that you guys got going on? Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I, I'm from San Diego. I've been here in doing startups for about 30 years. Uh, my startups have returned about $1.5 billion to investors. So uh, I've had a pretty successful career. And after my last startup, I was asked by the University of California, San Diego to come on board as an uh, entrepreneur in residence. And essentially uh, UC San Diego uh, raises about $1.3 billion in grants on an annual basis. And they have a ton of intellectual property but their strength is, you know, developing the IP, but not necessarily commercializing it. So in 2016, they began a program where they started to bring in entrepreneurs and residents. I was one of the uh, inaugural uh, EIRs and uh, was uh, advising different uh, uh, undergraduates, graduates, um, uh, even uh, uh, staff and uh, uh, faculty on different projects that they had. And in the process, I was introduced to a couple of gentlemen, Fabio Traversa and Max Deventra, two PhD physicists from UC San Diego that had invented this new compute architecture called MEM computing. And the architecture was designed to overcome essentially the von Neumann bottleneck that we experience in computers today, which is a big reason why computers why compute performance today isn't growing on an exponential basis. Uh, And it's part of the reason why people are seeking out such uh, next generation type technologies as quantum computing. However, these two physicists being experienced in quantum computing and and other computing technologies were focusing on unconventional computing methods. So those are methods that aren't quantum that use current technology and try to see if they can't overcome some of these bottlenecks. Anyway, they had been successful in overcoming the bottleneck they had. Everything was theory at the time, but it showed that they could solve essentially uh, exponential problems in polynomial time. So that means problems that currently grow exponentially in compute time, they were able to solve in theory based on this mem computing architecture. Uh, They're able to solve it in reasonable timeframes that Uh, us mere mortals could deal with. So instead of hundreds, thousands, even millions of years, these computations could complete in minutes and seconds. Uh, The challenge was they were, the the technology seemed uh, almost too good to be true. They were struggling to get grant money. And uh, I worked with them and decided, hey, uh, we, we got along really well. Let's form this company and let's see if we can't commercialize the technology ourselves. And how's that going so far? So it's great. Uh, we, the first thing we did was we had to build a prototype. And so we worked with the San Diego Supercomputer Center because we needed a unimpeachable third party to evaluate this technology for us. So the Supercomputer Center agreed to, to uh, do that for us. And my, I'll tell you at the time, my whole uh, uh, you know, explanation to them was I didn't care what the answer was. I just wanted to, for them to validate it. If they came back and said it didn't work as an entrepreneur, I'm happy with that. I'll fail fast and move on. Uh, but of course you hope that it's gonna work out. So the first thing we did is build a prototype that we could test or that they could test. And now the underlying technology is a new computer architecture. It's a new circuit architecture that is different than what you see today, but still manageable or, or buildable in silicon. However, when you first test a circuit, you tend to build it a uh, software emulation first because that's the cheapest way to do it. You can work out your bugs in software and uh, evaluate the technology. So that's what we did. We built a software emulation of circuit, presented it to the supercomputer center. And what we found though, uh, while we were expecting that we're honestly going to be a fabulous semiconductor company that we're going to be a company that has to build a chip. Well, the software emulation of the circuit was already so efficient. We're able to solve problems today faster than anything else was, was able to solve them. So um, what they had done was taken a set of, uh, of 
hard computational problems, optimization problems specifically, that were used as part of a competition. The best in class solutions at the competition were taking about 30 minutes to solve this, these problems. With our solution, we were able to solve these problems in sub-second time. And what happened from that was that we realized that we could actually take our technology, bring it live as software. So go out first as software uh, emulation. We've gone live or went live in 2019 with the beta version of our software as a service model. We've got over 20 companies that are using the technology today and we're uh, uh, solving problems that are intractable to current computers. So it doesn't mean they're impossible to solve, but the amount of time it would take to solve would be uh, years or longer and therefore not practical. Um, and and uh, we're solving these problems today in, in minutes and seconds. Well, that's that, that brings up a good uh, segue, right? So what, what kinds of applications do you uh, do you have for this type of technology? You know, talking about this amazing computing power, uh, what, what's it used for? What do you what do you what's your first uh, what are you tackling in the industry right now? Right. So our first focus has been on uh, combinatorial optimization problems. And while it sounds like a big word or big words, the, the, uh, we know those in layman's terms as scheduling and routing type problems. The first companies to come to us were in the transportation logistics world. So if you think of a UPS or a FedEx uh, or Amazon, when they're delivering to your door, actually calculating that route, the most efficient route, when you have a hundred or more packages delivered in a current in a given day, would actually take thousands, if not millions of years, quite honestly, to calculate the optimal solution. Now they're calculating a solution today, obviously, but the problem is that they're, they're doing approximations. So with our technology, we're able to actually provide a fully optimal solution. And this really boils down to at that scale, uh, really a, a savings in the order of millions, if not tens of millions of dollars monthly because of the scale of the problems that they have. So, uh, but backing up our first proof of concepts or first evaluation of technology in the commercial space was with the Port of Singapore. The Port of Singapore present us with an op a port optimization problem. I can't go into the specifics of the problem itself, but this was a problem that was taking over 70 hours to compute using best in class solutions. And they presented us that same problem. Uh, and and it, this 70 hours also scaled exponentially. So if you increase the size of the problem, the number of variables, number of constraints, the problem would go from 70 hours to maybe 300 or 3000, and then just keep going up from there. With mem computing, we took that same 70 hour problem we did an apples to apples comparison using the same type of hardware that they had been using. And we were able to solve that 70 hour problem in one hour and our compute time actually scaled uh, linearly. Now, uh, taking that a little further, our technology is hardware agnostic because we are emulating a circuit. So we're actually able to highly parallelize our solution and then distribute it over GPU as well. So that same problem now distributed over GPUs, we're solving in sub-second time. So, so we're talking about a problem that was taking them over 70 hours, and we're now solving that in sub-second time. That's amazing. That's truly incredible. The, so uh, to segue a little bit, uh, you know, reading something recently, you, you recently got noticed by the Air Force as well, correct? Correct. Tell me yeah, a little bit more about that. Go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> talk about that too. Sure. So yeah, we were uh, brought into the Air Force Space Catalyst Accelerator in the uh, the fall of 2019 cohort, and which has been really fantastic for us. Uh, it introduced us to a new market. Essentially, uh, we concentrated on the satellite market, which was something we were really not aware of as an opportunity. And, uh, and the, the, essentially the catalyst has opened some tremendous doors for us and we're really excited about uh, the opportunities going forward in, in that space. What exactly uh, have you got the opportunity to do for the Air Force? This applies to another application of this process that you mentioned, you know, between supply chain and scheduling for, uh, 
you know, you know, one of your air cargo situations, uh, your, your uh, case studies. But uh, what what does that do for satellites per se? Right. So on the satellite side, we looked at uh, essentially two applications, and in fact, we have filed for uh, an SBIR phase one on these. It, it's uh, looking very promising that we're going to receive that. We're waiting for the final word uh, that we should get in the next week or so. But the, the two areas that we saw as great potential for our technology is first the compute performance on satellites today. So the advantage of our technology being implemented as a soft emulation means that we can actually upload this technology, this software to satellites that are in space today and in, in essence improve their compute performance by orders of magnitude for specific problems. And so they'll be doing this processing on board the satellite themselves. You don't have to wait to process this data when it gets out to the ground station. Correct. That's the major advantage is that we'll be with our technology, what we believe we'll be able to do is help the satellites reduce the data before they send it down. And because that's actually another challenge that they have is related to scheduling that data and routing that data down to the other satellites in a constellation in order to uh, get to the ones that have the ground link. And then of course you have issues with ground links where there may be weather or other things that impact the performance of that ground link. Uh, and so you, the, the getting all the data down there is something you have to prioritize and is, is a very difficult scheduling and routing problem. That's actually the other port or part of the uh, opportunity that we we see in the uh, in the satellite field, which is then we can actually optimize the scheduling. So again, this scheduling is being done just like UPS, FedEx, and Amazon are delivering packages, but it may not be as optimal as it can be. And especially in the DOD field, when you're talking about getting data and uh, information to warfighters, the performance and, and accuracy and also the uh, uh, the amount of data that you can can get down because you can optimize uh, optimize those those deliveries is extremely important. And another area that we see as as one of the applications, uh, the early applications for this technology. Uh, amazing, that's great. Uh, so when it, talking about this uh, software emulation of what you have, uh, so possible other fits for this is running, you can run this processor within a cloud environment too, correct? Correct. So our first application, we sort of have a crawl, walk, run type of approach. The first application that we delivered is a software as a service model. It is running on the cloud today. And it's it's actually, I should, a little commercial here. It's free to use. It's a, a freemium model where if you're doing evaluation and test, it's free to sign up and use the product in order to validate it yourself on your own problems. Uh, then the next step is we'll develop a software development kit so that you now can take this same technology and use it on premise. The oh, software that was my next question in terms of, you know, being in the cloud, but you know, what if I'm disconnected with those warfighters, for example, and I want to take full advantage of what you have, right? So exactly. And yeah, so that's, that's coming later this year. The first software development kit, that's the type of technology we'll need or the type of packaging essentially that we'll need in order for that to be able to be uploaded to satellites in space or anything anything from an IoT perspective where you want to do compute, uh, improve your compute power at the edge. And then ultimately, we're also building chips. We will be building chips of this technology. And the beauty of this technology are, is that in hardware, when we re represent it in hardware, we will be solving problems in microseconds. Essentially, we'll solve a problem in real time. So the problem for the Port of Singapore that I mentioned that we had gotten down to uh, sub-second time uh, uh, with, with GPU, we would actually, with a mem computing ch uh, chip, be talking microseconds for the same problem. And, and that's actually a small version of the problem. So even much larger versions of the problems that would beyond, go beyond 70 hours and actually take, take uh, years or even millennia because of the scale of these problems, we can solve in microseconds. So the, there's going to be, and that's another advantage, I think, for the satellite space is in a few years, we'll have the next generation of our technology, which is chip-based, 
And those chips, once made space rat hard, could then be uh, um, uh, uh, installed on the uh, the next generation satellites that are going up, and then either it'll you know, even further improve the performance for the applications that they have on board. That's great. Uh, do you have one of the, just just kind of you know talking about a scenario that might take years? Of the process is uh, it can be difficult to fathom. Do you have an example of that? You know some. Yeah, we uh, quite a few. Um, uh, for instance, I, let me go back to the Port of Singapore problem. So I talked about the original problem set that they gave us that was taking over 70 hours. They took that same problem. They uh, scaled it up by three times the size. At three times the size, the estimate to solve it using current technology, current best-in-class technology, is actually 13 billion years. I know that sounds outrageous, but it's that's just the the reality of these problems as they scale exponentially it just it goes off the charts really fast what does scaling uh, to three times mean i mean in terms i mean how did they get operations done today if it, it's if it's that that much of a hindrance well again the, the so today people are solving the problems by using approximations so okay. you're able to solve these problems but you're not doing it optimally in the commercial field this results in costs right so when we talk about, um, there's less that I can share about the Port of Singapore problem, but if you generically talk about your UPS, FedEx, and Amazon type problem when they're delivering packages, uh, the, the market data that's out there today basically says that if they could save one mile per vehicle per day for a year, and this is multiplied over tens of thousands of vehicles that they have delivering packages, they'll save $50 million. And that's because of the wear and tear on the vehicle, the gasoline that you use, the maintenance that's required for the vehicles because of the miles that they travel, uh, the overtime and just you know hours for the employees that are the drivers that you by by cutting it by one mile per vehicle per day, you're saving 50 million. Now, there's a huge opportunity for much more than that. So with those companies, we're expecting that what we'll actually be able to deliver is is maybe five, 10 miles per day advantage per vehicle. So you're talking something in the, you know, maybe half a billion dollar annual uh, type of cost savings. And, you know, it's, it's just the scale of these problems is, is uh, tremendous. So, and did I actually, yeah, so I mentioned, sorry, that it took 13 billion years uh, if we were, they were able to solve this problem that was three X bigger. Understood. That, makes a lot of sense that they're approximating and, uh, in some ways are using best guesses just to get around the time constraints. Correct. So, right. So they're not doing, they're not solving this 13 billion year problem, which is the optimal solution. The, the, but if you were to try to solve the optimal problem, again, that's the type of, you know, just beyond the age of a human. So it's, it's completely unusable. And that's what kind of defines intractable problems. However, and this, this is where we struggle a bit with uh, when we present this information, we solved this same problem again, distributed over GPUs. We solved this 13 billion year problem in less than a minute. So this, this starts to sound like it's too good to be true, but these are real solutions. We have tons of, of uh, case studies and white papers and peer reviewed scientific papers on our website that go into this detail. And again, the key thing is uh, an advantage now of having the software as a service model live and making it a freemium model that people can use without having to pay for it to try it is that you don't have to trust us you can go and use it yourself and test on your own problem to see how well it performs. And that's a, that's a good introduction yeah. to folks who are, who, who, who want to, you know, just get into understanding what the benefits are. You know, I, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure just you're blown away still by the performance when you first run it too. I'm sure, right? Like all of a sudden one minute, Whoa, see, look, look who we yeah. just did. So, uh, no, those are amazing, amazing numbers. Yeah. Uh, I want to take the conversation in a slightly different direction and ask you about your personal experience. Uh, we have a diverse audience, and uh, when and when it comes down to 
whether it be the geospatial industry and doing um, uh, location-based analysis, imagery analysis, or, or actually supporting that community with doing uh, uh, HPC or development, GIS development in some way, uh, running servers in the background and infrastructure. Uh, a lot of folks want to know how you got involved with uh, just just computing in general. You know, what, how how you built up your knowledge base um, over the years to get where you are today. And this is where I'm aiming at the uh, the educators out there who watch the show and uh, want to know want to give options to their students. Uh, hey, you can take your career in this direction, and it's a lot more appealing than you realize just by focusing on. Uh, it's it's much more than just computing. Your the impact uh, learning about it. The, the impact applies to a much broader industry. You can get involved with so much, right? So, Absolutely. yeah. So so I want to I want to ask you about your experiences and where you are, uh, how you got where you are today, too. So yeah, thanks. Uh, it's that's a great question, and I'll tell you why. I, I I kind of uh, just my career evolved from the the ground up. Uh, I started, uh, in, you know, in college, I actually was a math major, got my degree in mathematics. Uh, um, and, but I realized that if I had, if, if, if I wanted to continue in mathematics, I'd either have to get a graduate degree or, and then become a teacher or professor or the other opportunities that were uh, the best opportunities out there at being like an actuary for a insurance company, which didn't appeal to me. Uh, although I've read since that it's one of the least stressful jobs in the world. And, and instead I, I uh, went into computer science and, and uh, software and hardware, which is extremely stressful, especially because I immediately went, or shortly after I began my career, I went into startups and I, that's an area that I recommend for a lot of people to consider and try. And I'll tell you the one thing about startups is that you there's so much growth that you get through being involved in a startup uh, because you're so every, the companies are small. You're so close to the business. You see activity that goes on that you would be completely isolated from from a big company. And in fact, when I hire people into a startup, one of the first things I tell them is that if you take a job with us, I guarantee, and this is for any startup I've done, I guarantee that you'll leave richer, but not necessarily financially, but that you leave richer from the experience that you get because you are exposed to so much more. You're forced to wear many hats because companies can't afford to hire people at the, in startups you hire people six months to a year after you needed them. So somebody else has been doing that job. And one of the uh, educations you may get from startups is that you never ever want to do another startup, but there's value in that. Uh, but the other thing is if you want to continue doing startups and even if your startup fails, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of advantage and there's so much that you learn from failure. In fact, I've learned more from my failure than my successes that you, if you want to continue with a startup, the next startup you go to you can talk to the people and make sure they don't have the same issues that you may have seen that could have been, you know, could have contributed to the failure of the previous startup that you were involved in. So, um, and in fact, uh, this position here for me is a first time CEO position. I've always been the technical person who developed the product and led those teams prior to that with all my previous startups. However, when I went to UC San Diego and met uh, Max and Fabio, and Fabio is the CTO of the company. He's the uh, you know, main inventor of the technology, but, and Max, who uh, is a professor of physics, has, has stayed at UC San Diego and has remained very involved with the company. But um, again, the, you know, the issue there was that between the three of us, I was the one who had the most business experience and therefore defaulted to the CEO position uh, in this particular company. And, but I could only have done that because of all the on the job training, essentially I had received by being involved in many, many startups and being close to the, uh, those decisions and seeing how they're made and how to raise money and things of that nature. So uh, taking it back one more step, that's, I think that's awesome career advice. For those who are, you know, uh, actually 
struggling with what to do in high school from getting started, what would you recommend to those students who are just, what direction should I go ed, you know, from, from, from my educational path? You mentioned you got a math degree. Would you have done something else or was that exactly the path you took that, that you recommend other people to get where you are? Well, so I have older brothers and all my brothers uh, were engineers. And so I kind of fell into that, that path uh, because of, you know, my, the, my mentors. However, I will tell you after I got into startups and I've really enjoyed and from day one enjoyed being in a startup, I always thought to myself, I wish I had gone into uh, business or marketing or something like that, a more social aspect of the business. Um, so I, I don't think it, it really, you've got to pick something that you enjoy doing. Uh, um, and then, you know, again, I think that if you're able to, uh, you know, join the startup what is as, uh, you know, as one of your uh, first uh, jobs, professional jobs, because, you know, the advantage is, especially as you're, you're younger, if you go to a startup and it fails in two years, it's going to have so little impact on your uh on your your uh, your career and in fact there's there's still you know there's people who recognize the value and the learning that you received even if you then go to a much larger company because they're going to know that you've got some really great on uh you know ojt from what you went through um so i think you know and, and i'll tell you the other thing that i'll mention uh regarding high school and and uh, undergraduates you know I wasn't really as focused on my career at, at those ages. I was more focused on finishing schooling and um, and all that. But I'll tell you, once I became an entrepreneur in residence at UC San Diego, I was blown away by the undergraduates and the startups that they were running. And uh, some of them were quite intense. And they're, here they are running a startup. Uh, at the same time that they're trying to get their undergraduate degree. And some of these startups had been projects that they had started in high school. So they, they yeah. did start early with these, these particular things. And, you know, I look back and think, you know, I was just trying to, to, to graduate, you know, make sure I finished my classes, got reason, reason, uh, reasonably good uh, scores on my tests. I, and to me, that was a 60, 80 hour a week job just to get through college. And here they're doing, two jobs that are essentially 60 or 80 hours a week. So if, if you've got the entrepreneurial spirit uh, when you're younger and it seems like there's there's more exposure to that, I, you know, I, I, I just uh, uh, impressed with people who who go that route on their own and and certainly recommend it. And even if they don't have the idea um, to try and get involved with those who do. Awesome. Well, thank you for talking about your background a little bit and your in your insight into uh, career development uh, for for those who are trying to figure out where to go in life. I think uh, you know, uh, uh, parallel to what you do at Mem Computing, uh, I think as we get into more of these advanced technologies, trying to build the talent to work within it is is start it's it's ever challenging because the, uh, the, the workforce is, uh, in such demand. So we need to, you know, spend these folks up and, uh, and, and, and just to try and inspire them that, Hey, this, this is really interesting stuff has a broad impact. And, um, you know, and then there's a lot of things you can do with it. it you know, they have to learn at a young age. Right. So. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to fail. Absolutely. Uh, my, my first startup, we, I'll tell you, it was a bunch of uh, 20-somethings that you know, we were hired by some very uh, experienced and capable executives who brought in because of, the, you know, you have less funding than a large company. And there was a bunch of us 20-somethings that were working our butts off to, to make everything work. And we didn't have the experience to know what not to do. And, and we made plenty of mistakes along the way, but, but we were encouraged we're given the rope to be able to make those mistakes and then if we made the mistake we weren't chastised we were then given the responsibility of fixing it so i think that's you know look for that in wherever you go to work if you're early in your career or anytime really you want to be trusted and be allowed to make mistakes and then just know that you need to fix that mistake and move on from there and learn from it and and, and uh, continue on 
That's great, John. That's awesome advice. Uh, what? Um, so with that said, I want to bring it back to MEM Computing briefly to, uh, do you have any other plugs and things you want to talk about in regards to the company? Uh, yeah, so I'll tell you that, so this technology is an entirely new architecture. We can ultimately apply it to many different areas. I've, I've mentioned our initial product development is related to these optimization problems. So scheduling and routing, which are extremely large and complex problems that companies face and begin to scale of them. As I mentioned, you know, there's opportunities for them to save uh, millions of dollars on a monthly basis, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on an annual basis in that environment. However, uh, we've also recently done some research and development on problems in the uh, uh, AI space, specifically with the using mem computing as a training method for neural networks. So we've taken mem computing, and this is actually a new emulation of the circuit, a new circuit architecture using our, our fundamental technology, but in, uh, intended to replace the uh, gradient descent based learning, which is what we all use for our neural, uh, neural networks. And what we actually found was that this, and again, this is a software emulation, it's not, not the chip version, but we'll get to that in a few years. Um, the, the software emulation was already five or six times faster than current standard methods like ADAM and uh, SGD. And we were, the, the key thing uh, above and beyond that though, is that our training was more robust and actually was more accurate. So that's, that's a key aspect. We're excited that, you know, this is another option, another methodology. Companies all over the world are using neural networks for so much decision-making and decision support. And the training is really the biggest issue and challenge. And it can take, you know, days or weeks uh, uh, to do training and retraining of a neural network. So having a speed performance, you know, improvement is important, but more so is really the, when the training is more robust and you have more accuracy, that, you know, the companies are always looking for some little improvement that they can make. And I think that, uh, you know, we're excited about having this this being able to offer this solution again, it's it's still in R and D. It'll be commercially released uh, later this year, and when we do that, then we, we're excited that companies will have options. It may not be the best solution for all situations, but it it certainly will be for some. And again, it, it provides people options on doing training, which they don't really have today. They just use the current standard methods. So, so the. So the compound on that, uh, for those who watch in the geospatial industry, they can integrate your software emulator uh, for what you have and attempt to use that alongside their uh, uh, neural network uh, scenarios and try it out? Yeah, so what we'll end up developing for that is we'll develop tools uh, or libraries, essentially, that in integrate into things like TensorFlow and PyTorch yeah. and, and other tools. So that will tend to be a uh, like a software development kit that people will integrate into their own systems. It's certainly possible to do it over the cloud and there's certainly a cloud uh, solutions that people have for things like TensorFlow, but it'd probably be more of those providers using our, our technology internally. Incredible, That I think that'll be an awesome uh That'll be an awesome integration for this crowd who who are looking for better ways to process data. Uh, it's definitely a huge problem, especially trying to do it object detection and, uh, and 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 do stuff like that near real time. It's a challenge. And instead of you know receiving things like uh, full motion video feeds or doing imagery um, and, and then waiting hours, if not days, for the results after the fact. So. Right. And that's, you know, that's another area. Again, we can apply this technology in so many places that image processing and image recognition, there's so much uh, in so many cases, these problems boil down to optimization type problems. They're currently solved in a variety of different ways. We haven't really addressed them specifically with anything we've built today, but that's another large area that I, I see in our future, maybe not in 2020, but hopefully in 2021, we can jump off uh, that bridge and work on some problems uh, uh, on in image processing as well. Great. 
Uh, well, John, uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you real quick. You actually sent me a video, an explainer video, and that goes into more technical detail of uh, what you have and what's why is it unique from a quantum computing standpoint, correct? Right. So now I should uh, be clear, though, that our technology is not quantum. Oh, no. Okay. That's good you clarified because yeah. I heard it before and I think I got a little bit uh, confused in that. Right. So the, the key thing is that we're, we're a non-quantum solution, but we're providing today the performance expectations that we're actually seeing in quantum computing. And if I can put in another little tag, uh, I mean, we there's been many situations where quantum computing benchmarks have been run against MEM computing and we've been able to solve these benchmarks at scale uh, today where quantum computing is still in its infancy. It's still in R and D it's expected that at best quantum computing uh, will be able to handle industry sized or industry scale problems, but it, it's about 10 years out at best. So the key thing is um, if you're solving quantum computing problems today, or you're developing problems for to test on quantum computers, we actually handle those formats natively as well. So uh, it's it's kind of a side to what we do because it's not a huge market today, but it is another implication or indication of how uh, how strong this performance is. And and the, uh, the explainer video uh, that you're talking about explains the science behind them computing and why even with a non-quantum solution, we're actually uh, providing some of the same capabilities or able to get the same type of uh, performance and using similar methods, but in a non-quantum fashion um, that, that again, relate to, that give us this performance that we're, we're providing. No, I appreciate clarifying that. And uh, that video uh, in our uh, more finished version of this interview is uh, going to be put together. It's going to be at the end of this interview. Um, uh, for those on Twitch, you'll see a different version later on. Uh, but it'll be posted on YouTube within the next couple of days uh, alongside of our uh, in, in the rear of our, our interview here. Um, well, uh, John, uh, thank you for joining me Uh this is John Bean, CEO and co-founder of MEM Computing. Uh, you can find more about them at www.memcpu.com. And uh, we will post your, uh, well, your preferred contact information within the show notes as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, once again, I, I appreciate you for joining us and explaining. Give us an introduction to your company as well as your uh, background uh, well, in your career, for that matter. Uh, and we hope to talk to you uh you know, later down the road, uh, with more releases, more updates uh, on your technology and how, how it's applied across the entire industry. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Please stay tuned to watch or listen to mem computing's explainer video after this episode. Welcome to the mem computing technology overview. We owe modern computers to Alan Turing, an English mathematician and one of the world's earliest computer scientists. Alan Turing invented the bomb machine, which the Allies used to decrypt German cryptography during World War II. Most importantly, Alan Turing developed the concept of the Turing machine. This became the basis for computers as we know them today. John von Neumann was a peer of Alan Turing during the earliest and most influential stages in the development of what became our modern computer. John von Neumann developed a realization of a Turing machine with his von Neumann architecture. What you will notice is that the central processing unit, or CPU, is separate from the memory unit. Now, keep this all in mind, because we're going to introduce MEM computing and we'll point out the differences and advantages. MEM computing was invented by doctors Fabio Traversa and Max Deventra, two theoretical physicists with a background in unconventional computing methods. Working together at the University of California, San Diego, they set out to develop a new computing architecture that would overcome the inefficiencies associated with the von Neumann architecture and would more closely resemble quantum computing from a performance perspective without the quantum computing overhead. In computer science, it's well known that our computers face a problem known as the von Neumann bottleneck. Recall that the memory and CPU are separated from one another in the von Neumann architecture. This separation results in a significant communication overhead where the CPU must continually push and pull data from memory. For the most complex computations that industry faces, this bottleneck causes computational time to grow exponentially 
while the input variables may only be growing one at a time. Traversa and Deventra began with what might be considered a simple concept. They presented an entirely new computing architecture where memory and compute are combined. The key aspect to the MEM computing architecture is driven by their specialized concept of computational memory. Over the next few years, Traversa and Deventra set out to realize this new MEM computing architecture. Through trial and error, they developed all of the mathematics required. They discovered breakthroughs that leveraged aspects of classical physics that had previously been ignored. With this, they invented a new computing architecture made up of computational memory. That is, memory that performs both the tasks of storing and processing of information. Patented and implemented as a software-as-a-service platform, MEM computing is the next generation of computational technology proven to solve today's hardest problems in orders of magnitude faster while increasing the quality and accuracy. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back and explain how the technology works. Let's talk for a second about how conventional logic circuits work. Take for an example an AND gate. Data enters an AND gate through the input terminals. The output is determined based upon the truth table associated with an AND gate and set to the output terminal. A logic circuit starts to come together by combining multiple logic gates. Data are fed into input terminals of the circuit resulting in several outputs. This output feeds the input of the next stage of the computation and so on. This continues through the circuit presenting the result through the output at the end of the circuit. This is a simple but accurate representation of how an algorithm is solved using a standard Boolean circuit. MEM computing changes this paradigm and instead of using conventional passive logic gates, we introduce the idea of self-organizing logic gates, SOLG. SOLGs are terminal agnostic. That is, an SOLG accepts both input and output from any terminal. All terminals work together to self-organize and satisfy the expected logic condition for the gate. Inside the SOLG, you'll also note that each terminal has an associated dynamic correction module, or a DCM. Let's assume that we have the following values associated with an SOLG, where there is a 1 and a 0 at the traditional input terminals and a 1 at the traditional output terminal. The DCMs recognize that this is not logically acceptable. The DCMs immediately activate, and the DCM on the upper right terminal will try to raise the voltage from a 0 to a 1. The DCM on the bottom terminal will also try to lower the voltage from 1 to 0. Note that these voltages are transmitting to the other self-organizing logic gates connected to these terminals. This becomes a process of negotiation where all of the SOLGs work together to find a set of values that reach an equilibrium and where all SOLGs are logically satisfied. A self-organizing logic circuit, or an SOLC, is created by building a network of SOLGs. Because all terminals accept input and output, therefore, unlike standard logic circuits, there is no restriction where the inputs are fed into a self-organizing logic circuit. Since SOLGs are active, the SOLGs immediately begin to negotiate with each other and naturally self-organize, satisfying all gates. In physics, this self-organizing negotiation drives to the lowest point of energy where all gates are satisfied. When this equilibrium is reached, the output of the circuit, i.e., the results of the computation, can then be read. This cooperative, self-organizing form of computation is known as intrinsic parallelism. Intrinsic parallelism is part of the magic of MEM computing. Each SOLG knows what the other SOLGs are doing, and each changes their logic state according to the state of the others at virtually the same time. This is completely different than the standard parallelism of current computers where each CPU works independently of the other parallel CPUs during a clock cycle. The CPUs communicate only at the end of each clock cycle, but not communicate during the clock cycle. MEM computing circuits are parallel in the true sense of the word. They are always communicating. MEM computing circuits work on a problem in a truly distributed manner. Each gate, that is, each SOLG within the circuit, is constantly aware of every other SOLG in the circuit, regardless of how distant one SOLG may be from another. Okay, let's get a little deeper. In this diagram, we show the correlations between voltages at different positions of the self-organizing logic circuit at an instant in time when the voltages show peaks. The voltage peaks are what we call instantons, and the correlations do not decay at all across the entire circuit, except at the boundary where one inputs the signals and reads the output. 
These ideal scale-free correlations, that is, correlations that do not decay spatially, are reminiscent of quantum entanglement in which the dynamics of all particles in the system are correlated in the sense that they are intrinsically dependent on or associated to each other. The system is spatially non-local and rigid. While memcomputing is not a quantum solution, it demonstrates some properties like this that are similar to quantum computing. The key aspect is that memcomputing is available today and runs on standard hardware in a standard environment. There's no need to supercool a memcomputing machine to near absolute zero, nor do you have to place it in a vacuum stronger than space, as is required for a quantum computer. We are often asked whether the circuit will get stuck in local minima. The reason is that memcomputing self-organizing logic circuits are designed so that while solving an equation, they go through a succession of instantons. An instanton is a classical trajectory of the equations of motion of the SOLC that connects critical points in the phase space that have a certain number of unstable directions to critical points that have a smaller number of unstable directions. These points are also known as saddle points. That is, every time there's an instantonic jump, the circuit goes into a more stable state than before the jump, from one saddle point with some unstable directions to another with less unstable directions. This process is repeated by the memcomputing self-organizing logic circuit until the last jump. The last jump is to the equilibrium point where there are only stable directions, and this represents the solution of the problem. Perhaps in more simpler terms, the circuit always goes downhill toward the solution, jumping from one unstable state to another more stable state to another even more stable state, etc., until it reaches the most stable one, which is the solution of the problem. It cannot go uphill only downhill. That is, it can never jump from one state to a less stable state. I think we took you about as deep as we should go. Let's start to wrap up by explaining how this amazing new technology is being applied today. Our MEM CPU XPC Software as a Service is being used by many companies in the Global 2000 to solve problems associated with computational chemistry, supply chain, transportation logistics, scheduling, and oil and gas exploration. The next slide helps you visualize how to apply the technology. As an example, let's take a common and very hard optimization problem, the traveling salesperson problem. This problem can be represented as a mathematical equation. To use the MEM CPU XPC SAS, the equation is sent in the form of a mathematical programming system file, also known as an MPS file. The MEM CPU XPC SAS creates a custom self-organizing logic circuit that exactly represents the equations in the .mps file. This process takes nanoseconds. Your custom SOLC then immediately executes, simulating the dynamics of circuit, and then returns the solution of your problem. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website and read our white papers and publications proving the validity of our technology and its applications.